Brendan Smith. I'm the Arts and Humanities Coordinator for the City of Tacoma Park. And this is one of the many events we have in our Tacoma Park Arts Cultural Series. Tomorrow night we've got an exciting uh, African music talk concert. Uh, legendary African uh, radio DJ Georges Colonnais is going to be here. He's going to be talking about his life. And then uh, we're going to have a band DC High Life Stars play along with a Congolese singer, uh, Samba Mapangala. Uh, if you didn't pick up a brochure on the way in, you can get one on the way out. <coughs> the other big event we have coming up is our holiday art sale. It's on December 7th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. We'll have, uh, it's here in the building, we'll have more than 30 local um, artists, crafters uh, selling their work. Um, there's no admission to get in, and so you can get all your uh, holiday shopping done early. So, And we'll have a reception tonight after the reading. Uh, and then now I'm going to introduce uh, Tacoma Park Poet Laureate Kathleen O'Toole. He'll be your MC tonight. Thank you. Good evening. I'm delighted to see such a robust poetry audience on a cold night in November. And even more delighted that tonight we have four poets who have never read in this po poetry series before, which is great because we, um, Brendan, myself, and the Poetry Selection Committee were very focused on trying to expand our audience and expand the voices that we hear. And uh, this is also the first open poetry reading we've had this year. We've been mixing it up with themed readings, and so we had a themed reading on migration and the American immigrant experience in September last month for poets uh, to sing against the night, talking about uh, poets who have overcome serious disease or and or are caregivers. And so tonight, it's just poetry, the joy of poetry. And um, I'm frankly excited to hear somebody else's voice reading poetry because I've been out kind of doing a mini book tour to um, celebrate my new book, which I'm not promoting tonight, but I'm happy to answer questions about later. Um, my role here is to basically introduce the four poets, which I will do briefly now, but then you won't see me because they'll come up in alphabetical order and um, each read for about 15 minutes, and then we will gather for refreshments and book sales and more conversation after. So allow me to introduce you, and you have bios and pictures in your program, so I'm not gonna read what you can read yourself, but let me highlight a little bit about each of these poets. Um, also because I forgot my reading glasses, it makes it easier. Um, Judith Bowles, who is, uh, as, as I said, a first timer and who has taught at American University and has two books of poetry. I think we'll be selling um, uh, books afterwards, who's a neighbor from DC and is delighted to be with us uh, the first time and, and has read at the Writers' Center and Politics and Prose and a lot of other places. But we will hear her tonight for the first time. Um, and she told me she has a neighbor here who didn't, who has a friend in Tacoma Park who didn't know about our reading series. So we've got some people who can now promote this monthly gathering to other people. Jonah Colson, while he also lives in DC, he's really an, uh, a member, an extended member of our community because he teaches um, English as a second language at Montgomery County Community College here in Tacoma and uh, also has been published in some wonderful magazines. But the most exciting thing is that Jonah brought a number of his students here tonight. And uh, thank you and welcome. And we understand you've all been writing and reading poetry in preparation for this event. So that's a really joyful, and also at least one colleague of his who we're gonna be talking afterwards about poetry in the Ethiopian community. So great connections to bring to us, Jonah, thank you. And um, Kristen Farragut, who is from Gaithersburg, right? So a uh, Montgomery County neighbor, but who's reading here for the first time. But she's an experienced reader who does a lot of reading at uh, various open mics and the Words Out Loud at, at Glen Echo, as well as a whole lot of exciting activities, biking and reading and hiking. And so uh, we're expecting a lot of energy from Kristen in sharing her poetry with us tonight. And finally, Nabila Washington, 
who I am delighted to learn is a brand new resident of Tacoma Park, who has journeyed from Birmingham to Boston to Tacoma Park, and she tells me that she's come here because of the vibrancy of our artistic community. Um, I'll let her tell you a little bit about this, but she actually is holding down two jobs, including one with the charter school in Boston that she worked with, but she's just started a new literary magazine be called Lucky Jefferson, which is about to publish its first in print issue. So if you wanna get your poetry published, maybe you need to talk to Nabila afterwards. Um, I was a member of the selection committee that chose these poets, but I reacquainted myself with their work in preparation for tonight. And I'm especially excited that they're four very different voices, but very vivid, mysterious, and deeply personal poetic language. And I invite you to join me in welcoming them here tonight. So we will begin with Judith Bowles. Judith? Thanks, Brendan and Kathleen, and thanks for this reading place. It's a, it's a beautiful room, and I was telling Kathleen, I love the graphics, too, the, the poetry, the way it's written. It's wonderful, wonderful. <clears throat> um, the poems I've chosen to read tonight are, uh, have to do with sound, and they have to do with listening. And uh, two really critically important things to me, because um, in many years ago, in the late 70s, I lost the hearing in my right ear. And it was a, an acoustic neuroma surgery that I had, and I lost the hearing in my right ear. And uh, though I have good hearing in my left, what it's done is flatten sound, flatten sound out for me so that it doesn't, I can't tell direction that it's coming from. And, um, and also, it's, it's caused other problems as I've gotten older. And you may remember that sort of famously, Helen Keller was asked whether she would rather be blind or deaf. And she said that she would rather be blind because if you're deaf, your connections are cut off altogether. And I think that that's really crucial. And so it's interesting to me that I never, in these poems, set out to think about, I was not thinking about sound, but sound creeps into my poems. And this one is called Correspondences. And it has to do with the effect of sound, the effect of a gunshot, and uh, the, the crucial atmosphere that the gunshot sets up. Correspondences. An alley of soft pines my father planted on one of the multiple heel, hills in southern Ohio to frame his shooting range hid him behind the cabin he called Possum Run, a place he said would add years to his life. The trees gathered sparrows, busy being together. They're flitting a song in itself. They rose in an urgent communion, a breath taken up and released when the shot cracked the air. It was sound being seen, this rush and rise, an explosion in air of a hundred hearts beating together and moving together, like a story being told by a chorus about one lonely man. I live in the district and uh, we vote, I uh, moved to the district from Maryland about four years ago, and we vote in a church called the Church of the Annunciation. And I love it that it's called the Church of the Annunciation and that we go there to vote. And when we first moved from Maryland, I missed our old place of voting, which was the school, terribly, because we knew each other and, and it was, how's your mother, how's your dog, how's your son? Uh, when everybody came to vote. But when I first came to vote in the district, it was just this long line in front of the church. And yet there was something there that was so important that I learned. 
uh, voting at the Church of the Annunciation. The way the clouds moved across the vast November blue of the sky, like a colt cooped up too long, made me hurry my pace up the hill to the church. At the crest, the two giant sycamores had begun their unleafing, just barely. So the arch of their branches became separate, not fused under cover of leaves. They leaned slightly apart at the top as if to give room to each other for reaching. It was a cheerful long line at the church. No matter the weight, it had already taken each of us a lifetime to arrive at that place where we were going to be heard. And this is a poem actually about, about listening and about uh, sound. And it's based on a documentary that was made by Ethan Hawke. And he made the documentary, it's called Seymour, an Introduction. And it's about a concert pianist who was rather famous, but who, when he got to be turned about 50, developed a terrible stage fright and could no longer perform. And so he turned to teaching. And Ethan Hawke developed a bad um, stage fright, and he was in New York, and a psychiatrist that knew him put him together with Seymour Bernstein for a dinner. And that was the beginning of this association that they had, which is critically important to both of them. And so as he talked to Seymour and Seymour talked to him, he decided that he had to make a film about this man, and it's called Seymour, an Introduction. I highly recommend it if you can get it. If you can get it on Netflix, it's, it's a fabulous movie. And it's also, the poem also has a poem within it that is done by a friend of mine, and the poem is called Ossicles. And the ossicles are the little bones inside your ear that waver, and they, they're what carry the sound into your ear. So it's the pianist and the poet. Seymour Bernstein barely blinks when he talks, his eyes at ease in the light of the world as his hands poised over the keys when he asks us to mark how the note hovers in air after it's struck so that even its final hush finds a chord. He touches his student's arm with a gentle continuum in perfect concordance, urges her heart closer to Bach, reminds her to listen, to breathe. Like my friend Amy says in a poem, listen, the high kiss of Finch grabs a thread of air. This is a transport rapid as half of a breath, as if ears were satellite dishes on stems. She teaches, too, and waits as long as it takes for her students to hear. She knows what that means, how it helps to blend the word and the sound of the word so the ear and the brain work together. These tiniest bones hear us think. Yes, listen to the hush that carries the sound. This is a poem that uh, taught me, it taught me how it feels to be deaf. And uh, it's a poem that I witnessed behind a window looking out on a scene in Santa Barbara and uh, looking at the mountains and the wind. And it taught me that though I no longer have any sound in my right ear, that it's almost like a phantom limb, that it will not stop searching for sound. And I find that extraordinary, because I've heard people say that have had amputations, that they, have, they get itchy, it hurts, there's pain in the phantom limb. So this is about a phantom ear. <clears throat> White morning light. White morning light rises behind mountains like milk 
filling a glass that never spills. Trees stand in shade, waiting, silent as trees in the absence of light, to show who they are. Wind through the window keeps its sound secret. Like hands, it turns the leaves up, then over, a quick change of mind. Half deaf, my body strains like a dog on a leash towards sound, which moves through trees, through leaves, long grasses, their tassels afloat. A breeze gives no thought to the whirlblast of dust in its wake, to the crack of a spark breathed into loud life, the thick history of a deep-rooted oak struck. All evidence of the world as it lives in its backyard, so full of fragrance as if trying to speak. Are there still people who knew us as we once were? Even at night, my good ear hears light. My deaf ear still waits for the window to open. And this is a time I had with my three daughters in Santa Barbara. And uh, if you have children, you know how they sometimes communicate without words. And you know from the way they sit with each other and how they move, how they're getting on, and so forth. And um, we were by the ocean, and the dolphins were there. And I was watching the dolphins circle and come and come. And uh, the way that dolphins hear is, uh, is the, the sound actually resides, hit, hits them in the water. And I thought to myself, oh, that's like my girls. <laughs> Santa Barbara morning. All crowded today like an overgrown meadow, alive with color, with swaying with sand. It makes a case for the heart to open its fist and receive like they do, the dolphins, now lifting, wheels turning their rhythm of breath. They send and receive in equal measure. Sound is their light that beams through the water, meets matter that's dense, copies it home to the brain, revising moment by moment their place in this soft constellation. And my final poem is not about sound, but it's uh, just a poem I wanted to end with. It has uh, to do with uh, it, having watched a few episodes of an old rerun, a show that was in the 70s, called All in the Family. And it was a wonderful show. <laughs> and it was all about bigotry. And it was so funny then. So the poem is called All In. In the 70s, things were so good, we could laugh at bigotry as if it were just an act. It was Archie Bunker representing an endless joke which everyone got but him. And this made the gag richer and deeper. He smoked a cigar when he was sure the cliche he believed was true. He puffed it past all possibility and wailed up his eyes at the ignorance of Edith, of Gloria, of Meathead. And you may remember how we laughed. We were all in on the joke, and it was a good one that could never come true. Thanks very much. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, allowing me to be here in the company of such wonderful poets. Uh, Judith, thank you. They were absolutely beautiful, the images. Thank you, thank you. And I look forward to hearing Kristen and Nabila as well. So I'm going to read a few poems from 
my book tonight. And people, when my book first came out, people asked me, what are your, what are your, what's your book about? What are your poems about? And uh, I said, well, I, I don't know, right? So my best answer is there are a few different engines that sort of govern, um, govern the, the poetry here. And I would like to dedicate this reading to my students who are here this evening. So I appreciate you guys being here. So I'm going to start out. I have a series of poems in this book that ask a very simple, direct question from very often an authority figure. In this instance, it's going to be a doctor. And like I said, the question is very basic, but the answer is something that runs underneath, which is something that I'm concerned about. I'm often wondering, what is something that we don't say? Um, our expectations are inversed. So if you're at a doctor's office, these could be very ordinary questions one would ask. But I believe the answer is something that the doctor would not expect you to say. And if you did give him this answer, perhaps you um, would end up in a bit of a different place. This one's called Doctor to Patient. What brings you here today? A pain. It runs down my arm during the night. When did it start? A few years ago when I saw a bee land on a mint leaf. How does the pain feel when it snows like electricity? Are you taking anything for it? I read a story about a woman who vanished. Maybe she just turned herself into a fish. May I examine your arm? Touch is strange. I wonder if fish feel it when you slice their bellies. Does this hurt? There is no rule that states I must remain human. Can you bend your arm? When I was five, I broke this arm because it wanted attention. I think it still does. Does it only hurt at night? Yes, I dream I am a thin man, slicing down, slicing down tobacco leaves, large like green oars. Let me check your blood pressure. My heart is beating in sixteenth notes. I'm going to listen to your heart. I've never seen the heart of a fish. They don't sell that at the market. Everything is fine. Is there anything else? I feel like a man with a rope around his neck. So if you offer those responses to a doctor, I think you would end up in a, uh, maybe a different place. Another engine that's in here is I lost my father a few years ago, and that always begins to surface in one's work. It's sort of slightly cathartic experience. So I'll start with this poem called Lesson, very short poem. Lesson. It wasn't until a few years before he died when I came down the stairs on a Saturday morning and saw my father by the kitchen window, shirtless, ironing fresh blue tea towels, that I understood why my mother fell in love. I'll return to my father in a moment, but in between that, I also have a few poems in here in which things that don't normally speak, speak. And one thing that speaks here is an orange. If you ever have an orange lying on your desk, maybe you often wonder what the orange would say. So this is sort of the moment in which the orange is just being plucked from that branch, right? The orange speaks. For a moment, I forgot my fat, round self. I forgot my fear of falling and the black flies that siphon my pith and scent. For a moment, I broke this fruitful hook and circled the blossom grove, surveying human, spider, lizard, and snake. For a moment, I clung to this slender branch and remembered when I grew among lavender and cinnamon. I did not know what would become of me, food for mosquitoes or perfumed oil, 
For a moment, I savored the strange fingers pulling me down and saw the canopy of white bloom and green leaf above and knew my place at the cusp of that waiting tongue. So maybe you'll think differently about oranges the next time you eat one. It's another poem. It's called The Last Time I Saw My Father. The last time I saw my father, sound and marrow filled, he was standing on the front porch, almost the weight of a ghost. As I waved goodbye, I felt a nerve twitch like a dog's ear batting a fly. He never sold me the world. He never said that people are good. But the next morning, when he stopped like a hare snapped in a steel trap, my name knelt down beside him, and the smallest sigh became a lullaby. I touched his hand, and like any good son, straightened his dark hair before they carried him out into the air. So today is, well, it's always a special day, but I don't have any children, but I do have a dog. And today is my dog's birthday. She's six years old today. So I'm going to read a poem, a new poem, kind of about my dog, more or less. Before I had this dog, I never had really anything that I thought kind of missed me, in a sense. And now I feel guilt every time I walk out the door. <laughs> so it's in the voice uh, sort of speaking to my dog. Ode to my dog. I didn't know before you came here about the hesitation and guilt of leaving, about the eyes, silent and confused, trying to understand the distance at the door. How many words do you understand? Sit, stay, quiet, I'll be back soon. I always hear the howling behind my back and your unwilling whimpers to accept my return. And when I open the door and you come to me, each time I bend my forehead to yours and ask to forgive so much. So I think I'll read one more poem this evening. This is called The Other Life. I, I'm a Maryland boy. I grew up by the water. And I have a lot of water and fish life here. So it's called The Other Life. Before I leave, I want to know about the other life. I want to hear my name from another animal's mouth. I want to be the tender talons of coral or the delicacy of a crab's underbelly. I want to be the blue fish in the blue ocean, all current and unhunted. I want shimmer and fins that circle seagrass. But would I have the same heart, the same red muscle that pumps too faintly to hear its own thrashing? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Kathleen, and for inviting me. Uh, Jonah and uh, Judith, that was awesome listening to you. I look forward to hearing your poetry and um, checking out your journal. It sounds like a very ambitious project. Claiming a moment. Sweet scents swing to clapping leaves and crooning birds, breeze on which there's floating, bees tease crepe myrtle flowers, Hover shy of touch, a blue jay lands long enough for a prayer. Mindfulness calls for appreciation and also taking for granted to guard moments against all they're not. Enclosures, shackles, 
EKGs, bare feet on ice. Also present in burdens, ignored is gratitude. Also there but by God's grace. Also, what can be done? Of two minds cut short in study of myriad shades of green, grow back as four minds cut short in shapes of turns taken by sun and wind on limbs and grow again, a hydra unleashed. Heads oriented toward all compass tick marks, question whether the prayer is of thanksgiving, intercession, or repentance. Not mutually exclusive, but even the hydra has only one heart. There's an epidemic of grown folks talking to themselves in grocery stores. Makes me feel right at home. Not so used to that. No Bluetooth, just straight up self stammers and mutters, like thoughts can't be contained. Phrases need to jump ship and there's no one else to catch them. So I've gotten really quiet. Let words implode in mind, the way economies cave in, like stars supernova, but little like a gasp of regret. So here's a poem for all you frustrated uh, fiction writers. Um, I think a lot of us poets maybe play with fiction, but maybe have a hard time with plots. <laughs> this one's called Plots. <laughs> plots hide behind the ears of those who stand as characters, messy between strands of hair tucked there and tangled. They dare you to label pro or antagonist just to flip notions on a dime, ever giving vertigo as though there ever really were a point. Spotlight on time, like dancing drunk in the club, though trying hard to be more like a whirling dervish. So here's one that I haven't been brave enough to bring to any workshop and haven't sent out, but I think you all want to hear it. <laughs> anyway, I feel like reading it. It's called Challenging Roe v. Wade. I can stand for most things, almost most everything, but not this. Even what I can't stand for, I see will be cleared up eventually. We can't all be stupid forever. But at the crossroads of life, bliss, and things we can't bear are things we can't resolve. I now want to bury my head in sand, maybe a straw to breathe, still too exposed. No good can come of this, revisiting and reinterpreting with minds steadfast and hearts all lightning and tremble. Yet here we are. Things exist which we can't make peace. Requires more humanity than vitriol. Or to be left well enough, snug in the status quo, but they muck it up. Ostriches don't hide their heads, but check their eggs buried three feet deep, protect from jackal and mongoose. They sprint 40 miles per hour, no need to hide. I want to run to the other side of the fight already. Lines drawn in despair, despite everyone's good intentions. All right, and now I go to my morbid, bringing up my October poetry, a couple of pieces. This one's called Thin Place. The veil was always thin, made of gauze, moth swings, translucent. You able to walk two worlds, straddling loosely knit seams. The not Earth's seductive indifference to gravity and wariness holds promise. Your left hand fished for siren's notes, plucking bits of horrid, beautiful song. While your right pumped flesh, connections tangle between nether and sky. Living in the thin place, every moment is a sacrament, no relief from solemnity. Between the squeeze of clouds and molten metal, where you see your own ghost, and he's weightless. But maybe still hope. Leaving this world, you delivered a bird, dead, centered, broken, outside my window. I lift her with a towel, fly her to the top of a hill, lay her behind a tree on the rabbit's grave. I look to the sky and wish you both well, crying until looking down on her closed eyes. I imagine despite your fucking gruesome death, you tell me this, you are at peace. I pour wine into the earth and turn away. Second chances. I want to knit swatches of Egyptian cotton, wrap your scars in shades of sky, fill the furrow of your brow with sheer layers of gloss from kisses. Over years, peace made through surrender, still loss. Holes may close as well as fill, then what space is left? 
things unloosed, dulcet riffs or discordant riffs, bedrock. If salt water cured ailments of memory, I would weep over cup, offer it as though from lords with prayers for comfort. This is what they mean by second chances, to put blood back in the stone. All right, and now I'll move to my seasonal pieces. This one I wrote in the spring, but I was thinking of this very month. It's called Fallen Spring. You missed the blossoms around my house, tender cherry blossoms, the kind breezes like to cradle and carry off, magnolia petals pooling rain, red dogwood flowers under which I nail my unease. Remember last year I worried you'd miss their peak luster, hungry for time, yours and springs? I forgot this year until after petals fell to the ground and browned like a different season entirely. And then this, I think, I think some of Jonah's students might have read, <laughs> Leaves of Late November. Leaves spiral and fall in three-fourths time, dive a fast vertical twirl as though knowing no end point, float to and fro as in downstream descent, all reach the ground. They lie on top of each other, huddle against curbs, and nestle in edging between mulch and now rust-colored lawns. Leaves rest. Shade in summer sun, glory of early fall, they've been through a lot. I wish to take their place, climb to the top of the most naked tall tree and lay myself down like on a bed of needles. The spindly twigs might hold me for their sheer numbers and I could blanket them with their branches with my 98 degrees. That's what I have of life, heat and good intentions. What escapes our lips? Shifty, sharp truth hides in the hippocampus, sometimes trashing the place. Lost in both guilt and good intentions, the most fragile of virtues, parcels reason to skirt itself, sure as a blackjack dealer hitting a kid who holds 10. It sneaks in behind molars, escapes through bits of spittle and carbon dioxide, despite the best effort of lips. Once out, it grows like expandable water toys from the dollar store. It strobes like a murder of grackles beating wings between ground and midday sun. It stifles and strangles in sweet like the scent of the lilac tree from childhood makes us cough. Truth visits at night, disrobes, measures, shape of hips, size of freckles, shades of moles. Contrasts might keep us up all night, although reassured there's something with which to compare. Tired at daybreak, soft things grow, Maw of sunrise, Chanel comforter, silence. Truth leaves words in shambles. Path of lightning. It's a little bit of a fanciful piece, fantastical piece. What of lightning? The way water conducts electricity, the way we conduct ourselves in goodbyes, the jolts enough to stop a heartbeat, the second strike that can restart it. Dispersed in water, electricity travels only six meters, they say. Drifting in her upthrust beside my sea a thousand kilometers south, you reaching past, having failed to lay down short-term memory, I having failed to be memorable. Young love incites, even at a distance, even when old, you reach for her. But what if fish and birds, migrating trout, eating dried, I'm sorry, fried crayfish, swooped, scooped by swoops of ospreys, dropped in path of hungry bass, traveling to near you. Not much for swimming, but you love bare feet. You feel the current, so you don't sleep with her. Never mind that it's July, we're all mystified, ospreys and gulls, bass and trout, you and I. Me treading water, never one for touching the ocean floor. You walking away. Me confusing sea spray with rains. You wildly shooing sand flies, looking like a dance. The only element that matches the season is wishing. All right. And this is the one that's in the program, Moonlight Secrets. Folks think they fear dark, but really, the night. No, it's whispers of the moon, rackets in their hypnagogic state. She murmurs into space where they pine and mourn. She speaks in ripples and surges, tugging at waters of hearts and thighs, promises solace and illumination. They find belief more frightening than the lonesome, relieved when too full 
the moon spills her secrets, casting I lie with light on the creek. So this is one that I wrote this week. Entitled Family Dinner, a Metaphysical Check-In. Angst of youth elemental. Global warming, yes, but we shrunk the hole in the ozone. The Gulf War did not annihilate us. Malthus was proven wrong. Humans are smart, despite evidence to the contrary. An obligatory dinner turned essential discussion. Bullies tend toward half-wit. You're ugly and stupid, as though creativity isn't gorgeous. So we discuss ingenuity and comebacks, places for help, space for ignoring, and expansive possibilities in the transcendental, or even God. No one wants the night to end. Full of doubt, too, I check myself against pop psychology. Parents, it seems, cause all Gen, Ed, Gen Z's anxieties. Do I solve too many of your problems? Do I pressure you to be happy? No, they console, as miserable as I was in 87, spreading the end of the world. And I'll finish with this last one called Change Takes Energy. Thunderstorms rotate into hurricanes. Rockets hit escape velocity over 25,000 miles per hour. Birthday cake bakes at 350 degrees to tender perfection. No reason to expect any leftovers. Babies can't loan you 30 bucks, and butterflies won't take out the trash upon emerging from the chrysalis. And she isn't the one with whom you tied the knot, fumbling hands recalling torn through mittens on the rope toe because the hill was just too steep, and you never did learn to ski. Gloriously happy with a band on your finger, all that hide and seek behind you. He wouldn't keep you safe or bring you soup, but still, a kind of resting place. Buried beneath pills and knives, scars and scarves, you'll never find him now. You fu fueled the escape, and don't quite begrudge it, except in what is misunderstood as finite. All these worries of loss overlook what science shows us. Renewable energy in wind, tides, sun, your heart, and the smile you give your kids after taking out the trash. Thank you. Um, so my name is Nabila Washington, and I just wanted to say thank you for coming out tonight. Um, this is my first reading in 14 years, so I'm very excited and very honored to have been chosen to speak my poems tonight. So Lucky Jefferson, um, as mentioned earlier, is a literary journal that I started uh, in August, and it was basically born out of my pain and angst of struggling to be published. I remember calling my mom saying, Mom, like, why do I keep getting rejected? My professor is saying, you know, you're great at this. And my family's like, you're good. And the publishers are like, no, you're not. Um, so I started Lucky Jefferson to turn that discouragement and those negative feelings into something positive. Um, I wanted to help new artists, especially new writers who were pivoting in their career. So if you were an engineer and you wanted to start writing poetry, you could hit up Lucky Jefferson. Um, but I, I wanted to turn those feelings into empowerment, um, not only for myself, but I wanted to create a, a positive space of hope for other writers. Um, and so the, I only have three poems <laughs> tonight. Um, and they're poems that I've been working on for like the last two years, and they're a part of the book of narrative poems that I'm gonna be releasing at some point for my master's program. And so this first poem is called Not So Good at Imagery, <laughs> um, because in a poetry, <laughs> a poetry fundamental class that I took, my professor was like, you know, you're really good at narrative poems, but you're not so good at being descriptive. And I was like, what? So this is a poem called Not So Good at Imagery, and it's about a really crappy apartment because I'm sure we all have had apartments that sucked. So here we go. Vomit-colored walls, 
the low grunt of a beat up air conditioner, a mustard love seat waiting to be put together in a corner shaded by cobwebs, gnats congregating near my shower head, a moth or two eyeing them from the ceiling, the smell of stale wood stain playing chase with lemon pine saw, a family or a wild bear living upstairs, a soft shuffle of feet then bang, clank, children screaming giddily as they dart through the dense patches of grass behind this sullen brick house. The perpetual rumble of cars out front, then honk, honk. A row of green succulents, bathing in scarce sunlight, perched near grit-covered blinds. God, did I hate it there. <laughs> this next poem is called Grease. Um, and I want to thank Jonah for sharing it with his class. It's very personal. Um, again, I wrote this um, as a part of the collection of poems that I'm writing for my book. And it's about growing up in fast food. My mom, my family constantly worked. My father was absent. And I just remember always being in Burger King, always being in Arby's, McDonald's. When the restaurant would close, we'd go behind the counter and pretend to like ring up orders. And that was kind of like how my imagination and different parts of my personality grew. And so I wanted to write a poem about it. So here's Greece. I was once from Greece. Stale orders rang up at Burger King and curly fries at Arby's, shuffling from grandma to uncle, from uncle to auntie. Mama couldn't afford a sitter. I am from the 90s, AOL in all its glory, Carmen San Diego and Xena the Warrior Princess. I am from isolation, no brothers or sisters to pick a fight. Where is my daddy to tuck me in right? I am from troublemaking and curiosity, stealing mama's car keys for a joy ride, cutting off plaits with scissors in the dark, soaking in the bathtub to wash my sins, dodging Jim Crow. I am from laughter while tucked in mama's arms after being picked up, spun around, and flung into bed, then waking up to mama gone smells of old grease to comfort me. I am from Psalms 23. Would rather have a slumber party than Bible study, or a sister, I reckon, or more hours in the coarse dirt, or more, or more hugs from earthworms, or another Hot Wheels playset. The grease never came out, and the tears never stayed put. Go to sleep, little B, she would sing. And this last poem, also another po personal one, is called Where My Father Stood. And it's about growing up and having to have that difficult conversation with my mother about like, where's my father? Why do all the kids have like these wholesome families? Why did my dad choose to have a family with someone else, why didn't he choose to stay with me? And having to choose between the good things that she would share with me and also the bad things. So this is where my, my father stood. She said you were handsome and a little bit charming. She said you were a liar and found your promises alarming. She, she said you stood tall and gave the best hugs. She said you stuck it in everyone and infested her womb with bugs. She said you were handy and knew your way around birch. She said you left me inside her and got her thrown out of church. She said you were married now and had two sons. She said you were immature and that I should run so that when we met, I know your past. So that when we met, I'd be ready for things not to last. So that when we met, I know you're bad and you're good. So that when we met, I know where my father stood. Thank you.
Well, first of all, Nabila, I think this is the first of many readings that you'll be doing. So thank you for sharing your first with us. Um, well, I promised you all that you would hear four very distinct voices and some wonderful poetry. How'd we do? Yeah. All right. Um, for the poets who are joining us for the first time, I want you to know that uh, my colleagues, Bien and who else is with us tonight? I can't see back there. Craig. Craig. Um, that this has been recorded and will be on Tacoma Park, um, our public access station, but will also be on YouTube if you want to search it in a couple of weeks. So uh, there'll be a record of your first reading and you're joining us tonight. I just want to ask the audience, how many of you are at the third Thursday reading for the first time? Brendan, are you counting? All right. We said this year we were going to expand our audience. So I'm going to ask you to go out and tell somebody else about the Tacoma Park Third Thursday Reading. We will not be here in December. We take December off. We will be back in January on the third Thursday. And we have something special planned for January. We're going to be joined in January by the Free Minds Book Club, which is, uh, some people have heard of it, um, it's a group that uses books, creative writing, and peer support to awaken incarcerated and formerly incarcerated youths and adults to their own potential. So members of the, the Free Minds Book Club are going to be joining us in January to share their poems. And so I'm hoping that some of you and others will come back and help us welcome the Free Minds Book Club. And then I think in February we have couples and love poems for Valentine's Day. And then I think we have a couple of, we mix it up in the last few months. So I think one, one or two more themed readings and some open readings. So we will be doing these every third Thursday through May. And then in June we have an open mic. So you can all come back and read as a part of that. Um, anything else that I'm supposed to remind you of? Just that we're going to have refreshments in the lobby. And hopefully we'll get to meet some of you who are here for the first time. And at least two of the poets I know brought books. So if you'd like to buy a book from one of our participating poets. And thank you once again for joining us tonight.